Uh, it is Mother's Day, so we will say Happy Mother's Day to the moms. And uh, we're going to look here at a passage where there are two ladies involved uh, in, in some information as we kind of just round up, round off our uh, little four-part study here on the issue of soundness. Uh, we really never get done talking about soundness and, and having a, a life, a sound life. And we've been looking at that issue of, in life, having some soundness, some, some, some ground, grounding. And uh, we, we looked at the issue of sound doctrine. And uh, you guys can hear me okay? Okay. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> Gee, thanks. That's a back row Baptist back there. We'll get them in a minute. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we did talk about sound doctrine, how important it is to have sound doctrine compared to just having Bible doctrine. And, and, I'll, and by the way, I'll tell you, Peter talks to the little flock and the believing remnant about sound doctrine. and So there is a sound doctrine to them. It wouldn't be our doctrine, it's their doctrine. So we did talk about sound doctrine. Then we talked about being sound in the faith and, and the issue of, of keeping uh, ourselves protected. And we looked in 2 Timothy as we talked there about being sound in the faith and, and that issue of, uh, of, of the four attacks against you and I, and then those four uh, responses that we have, uh, that issue of leaving the Apostle Paul, leaving the Word of God rightly divided, moving over into emotional uh, state where, where you're using your circumstances and your emotions to validate truth and so forth, and, and getting off of, uh, off of the ball. And then we, last week, we looked at the issue of sound speech. And uh, I got an email this week going, man, that was the shortest message you preached in a long time. It was only like 40 minutes. I said, yeah, that's because the room was hot, <laughs> you know. Not today. It's nice and chilly in here today. So, but, uh, yeah, great. Somebody, I heard that, <laughs> you know. But uh, t today I just want to talk with you about a sound mind and, and, and pull from a passage and I would encourage you, by the way, to join us for Sunday school at the 9.30 hour because verse 7 is our text verse. We spent this whole morning talking about this verse. It's, it's ironic and how sometimes you're teaching both classes and you're about the same verses. And it just demonstrates to you and to me as you study the Word of God that you can be teaching our Sunday school hour at a deeper level and then come in and teach out of the same verse at a different level an even deeper level sometimes. But verse number 7, in, 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 and again, the part of the verse, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And, and, and the part of that verse I really want to hone in on is that issue of a sound mind. But you can't get there without getting the rest of the verse. Because the verse has things that come in that we're to we're to keep and we're to put into our thinking process. And, and when we put this information into our thinking process, it will then begin to impact and, and cause us to have some stability in life. And, and it's always fascinated me as I, over the years of ministry and talking to people and, and being around and just listening. You, you, you know, growing up, we were always told you got two ears and one mouth. You need to be quiet and you need to listen more. And the other thing was, was we don't pay you to think. <laughs> you know, just, you're just, yeah, I heard that one a lot too. <laughs> well, I think, I don't care what you think, we don't pay you to think. You just sit there and listen. And when you begin to listen to people, and you begin to hear, and you begin to listen to what they're talking about and where they're at, you real quickly begin to realize that in some of our Christian lives, we have no stability. We are up and down. We are all over, the, all over the map, and Paul says, God didn't give you the spirit of fear. He didn't give you it, it, the, the, the issues of being tossed to and fro. He rather gave you, he rather equipped you to have some stability and to have some things come your way, when things come your way, the ability to handle them and to handle them properly and to move them out of the realm of of, of he tells the Philippians in Philippians 1, terrified by your adversaries. He, you have the ability to move it from a realm of something terrorizing. You, you know, terror, that's a big word the last uh, 10 years or so. Uh, you know, the terrorist watch and terror. Terror, it, it's just in, it designed to intimidate you. It's just designed to shut you down. 
And when you begin to realize that, you know what, God didn't give me that attitude, that, that word spirit there, it's a small s, it's, it's not a big s. So we're not talking about the Holy Spirit, we're talking about an attitude. We're, we're, we're talking about a, 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 a disposition of our mindset of, of how we're going to think about things and how we're going to look at things. By the way, he says, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Fear there is the issue of intimidation. It's the, it, fear is a wonderful emotion when you can control it and control it properly. Just like anger, be angry and sin not. Anger is good. Anger is a motivating emotion. It will motivate you to fix what's wrong. Or it can motivate you to go get even with someone. See, And you got to know how to handle that anger. You've got to know how to handle that fear. Paul talks here to Timothy, for God has, given, has not given us the spirit of fear. Timothy's having a hard time. Timothy's circumstances, if you go back up into verse 4, greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy tears. Timothy is under the gun. If you look at verse 15, this thou knowest. What is Timothy going to know here? That all they which are in Asia, be turned away from me. You'll see Timothy is in the middle of ministry work and doing the work of the ministry where life is tossing him. Paul's mindful of his tears. He's down. He's under the load of ministry. Paul, Timothy knows that all they are in Asia are leaving Paul now, not all of them would be inclusive because Timothy hasn't left him. There's a whole list of men in chapter 4 that haven't left him. But Timothy begins to see the, 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 the way the body of Christ is going to be in the last days. The last days of the body of Christ, the last days of the dispensation of grace, started here in Paul's day. And Paul's laying out the picture here. That you know what's going to happen? Chapter 2, there's going to be, they're going to err, verse 18, concerning the truth, who have erred, saying the resurrection is past. There's going to be this movement away. Timothy, you need to be sound in the faith, Timothy. You need to stay the course. They're going to turn in chapter 3 to, to be men of reprobate minds and, and destitute of the truth and, and ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. They're going to be people, the, the, the body of Christ is going to turn into this. He's not talking about the lost. He's talking about believers, people who are saved, people who know who Paul is and what have they left? They've left him. They've left the word rightly. Do. They've caved to the intimidation tactics of the adversary. Chapter 4, they're, verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves. I love that. Teachers having itching ears. Well, you know, Rick, maybe you just don't do it good enough for us. Maybe we need somebody else. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> I appreciate, but that's what happens. That's what comes up. Well, maybe you're just not doing right. Maybe you're not, maybe we need somebody else. Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but what, what's the guideline there? Teaching the sound doctrine. Well, maybe you're just a little too rough around the edges. Well, I, I'll give you that. <laughs> but what is the body? What's the nature? What's the underlining thought process here. They got itching ears. We got to have something new. Give us something new. Teach us something new. And they shall, verse 4, they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Wow, look at the, the teach us something new, Rick. Come on, man. What, don't, I'm sitting there going, we, I look at you. I have one gentleman that that's usually what he'll hit me with every now and then, and I look at him and I said, dude, when you get the old, we'll worry about the new. You're not getting the old. You're not getting the foundation stuff. When you get that nailed down, when we don't have to have a conversation about sin in your life, then we'll worry about getting on with the new. Which, by the way, do you know what the new is? How to have power over sin in your life. It didn't change, it just got deeper. Well, we, we need something out of the Old Testament. Well, come on Wednesday night. We'll give you all of John. You know, there's out of the Old Testament. What's the nature? 
What are they doing? They're departing, aren't they? They're leaving. So in 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, they're leaving under some attack. They got this spirit of fear. Paul tells Timothy in verse 5, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, that unfeigned faith, that real deal, man, no fake news here, no fake faith here, not a hypocrite, not hypocrisy, not just faking it till you make it, but the real thing, Timothy, I called to you to remember that. It was first in your grandmother Lois, and then it was in your mom, Eunice. Boy, the, I know today's Mother's Day. The faithfulness of a faithful mom and a faithful grandma. It's critical. Dad is not on the scene. All indications is dad is a lost man. You go back and read in Acts 16. He's not on the scene. So here you have a scene. Not of a broken home of a divorce or anything, but you have a home that's broken. You have an unsaved dad and a saved mom and a saved grandma. And what did they raise? Who did they raise? They raised Timothy. A great leader here, a great companion of Paul, a, a great laborer in the, in the work of the ministry. So never, moms, never think that your job is ever done, because it never is. But don't think it's a waste of time. You grab those kids, grandkids if you're a grandparent, stick a Bible verse in their head. That's all you got to do, stick a Bible verse in there. You know, they come over and you know, grand, I, I've heard, I'm not a grandparent or anything, but I've heard that, you know, grandparents are, are is a great thing. Spoil them and send them home with mom yes. and dad, right? Yes. But while you're doing that, stick a Bible verse in there. Stick a verse in there that, that'll make them think about things. That unfeigned faith, Timothy, stir that thing up, verse 6. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir. Up, stir up the gift of God. Stir up that unfeigned faith. Stir up what's going on inside of you because I know, Timothy, you're under the pressures of doing the work of the ministry, of life itself. Verse 8, be thou not ashamed. There, he, he's under the pressures of, of, uh, of being ashamed. I didn't give you, God didn't give you the spirit of fear, intimidation. He didn't give you that attitude of being, being timid about speaking and preaching and talking because Satan just wants to shut you up. So he used religious intimidation. Come, come over to Galatians 2. Look at Galatians 2. So when, you, when we begin to talk about the sound mind, there's, a, there's an onslaught, there's an attack on the way you think about things. Galatians chapter 2 you have the meeting between Peter and Paul. It's, it's recorded by Luke in Acts 15. And Peter and Paul, and, and the, those who seem to be pillars, uh, Paul calls them here. And, and uh, if you look there at verse 6, but of the, these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accept no man's person. For, them, for they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. When they got together, Peter and Paul knew Israel's program. He's a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's a fundamental Bible believer. He knew all about their deal. Next verse, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, what they do in verse 9? When they, uh, and when James and Cephas and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace. Now, that when he says perceived the grace, he's not talking about grace as in unmerited favor and just giving you what you... He's talking about the message of grace, the doctrine given to Paul by the Lord Jesus Christ, risen, ascended, and seated in far above heavenly places. When they perceived the message given to Paul, they gave me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. And what happened? So there was an acknowledgement, wasn't there, by Peter himself and the 12 apostles that what Paul was doing was right, just, and was where we were going and was where God was and the program God was working on. Now, watch the next verses. Verse 11. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. 
For before that certain came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself. Now watch fearing them which were of the circumcision. Look at what Peter caved into. He caved into the spirit of fear. He caved into the intimidation of the religious crowd. Those of James, you go back into Acts 22, 23, 4, right in there, and Paul comes to James, and, and James says, look at all these that are zealous of the law. James had just given them the right hand of fellowship that we're going to the circumcision, you're going, to the uns, you're going over here to the heathen, and James has violated the agreement to a degree. But man, when he showed up, what did Peter do? What did the verse say? Fearing them which were of the circumcision. You know what he feared? He feared the religious intimidation. What do you mean you guys down there teach and preach that Christ died for your sins and that if you're a sinner, you're on your way to hell, the lake of fire. Don't you know hell is an offensive word? They haven't been on a job site lately in the construction industry. I hear it all the time. By the way, and they don't say, oh, Hades. They use the right word. So even the lost know the right word. Your new Bibles, they move that hell to Hades to soften it. If God wanted hell softened, he would have softened hell. But he didn't, because he doesn't want it softened. What does religion do? Let's, we just got to make, make you feel better. Paul says to Timothy, God didn't give you that spirit of intimidation. He rather gave you the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Boy. He gave you the spirit of power. Power. I shared last hour, come, come back with me to Proverbs 28, because I've got this verse written down next to this word power, because this is really what we're talking about. Acts, or, I'm sorry, Proverbs 28 and verse number 1. Proverbs 28 and verse number 1. When Paul looks at Timothy... And Timothy is under the pressure of religious intimidation. They're leaving Paul. They're following men who are taking them away from right division. They're, take, they're following men who are moving them away from the sound doctrine. And they're doing it with intimidation tactics. By force, they're moving this. Paul looks at Timothy and says, you need to remember what God gave you. And he gave you the spirit of power. Proverbs 28, verse number 1. The wicked flee when no man pursueth. Ain't that the case? You need to remember that. If you, have, you, have you ever watched that TV show, Cops? Yeah. Now they got this live PD stuff on that's supposed to be live, and it's not. You know, it's because... They'll have it here, and it'll be daylight, and it's dark. It's like, really? Okay, guys. You know, it's all put on. What happens when the guy robs the bank? What's he always doing? He's always looking over his shoulder, isn't he? Even when the FBI has backed off because they don't know, and they're just waiting. And they're waiting. They give him enough rope to hang himself, don't they? And they're just waiting. But what's he doing? He's running, isn't he? He's looking over his shoulder. But now the rest of the verse is about the power, the spirit of power. But the righteous are what? Bold as a lion. You see, that issue of having the spirit of, of power is the issue of having boldness and courage and having the ability to look at what's going on and not cowtail to the political correctness, not to cowtail to the intimidation, but rather to sit there and say, oh, wait a minute, I have power here in who I am in Christ. Come, come back over to, to 1 Corinthians, uh, I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter number 4. You see, folks, when, when you talk about power, the Word of God is quick and powerful. 
When you're talking about the power of God and, and we, that we have a power, in, 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 in 2 Corinthians 4, verse number 7, but we have this treasure in earthen vessel. The treasure there is the ministry, the work of the ministry, verse 1 and 2. We have this treasure in an earthen vessel that the excellency of the power, the boldness, the courage to do the work of the ministry may be of who? May be of God and not of us. Why? Because if it's you, you're going to fail. You're going to make it worse. You're going to muddy the waters. God's going to come along and keep it clean and pure and clear. That's why in 3.5 he'll say, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. You see, folks, when Paul says to Timothy, and he says to you and I that we have the spirit of power, it's in connection with we don't have the spirit of fear, that intimidation, but rather we have some boldness and we have some, some courage and some integrity to keep moving and to keep doing what we're doing, whether it's in life or whether it's in ministry. As you're in life, what do you do, what do, you do in life? Well, you get up, take a shower, get dressed, thank you. And then usually where do you go? Go to work. If you're retired, you do whatever you do, back to bed, like retired people. I tell you what, go back to bed. But, but what do you have? You have a routine, don't you? What happens when that routine gets thrown out of whack? When I was driving the school bus, I was driving the special ed buses, and I was a relief driver. And, and I, would, I got put on a route because the driver liked every other Wednesday off. The problem was, was every other Wednesday that she was off was her hardest student to ride. Well, the office won't do anything about it because we need the drivers at the time. So I, they stuck the young man with me. He had autism, and he was, he was a handful. Because, boy, if you hit the bump the wrong way, he was, Poo! and I'm talking about a bump. I and mean, he was very sensitive, which was fine. I understood him. I, 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 you know, it was fine. I jumped all over that bus driver because that bus driver broke up his routine. And if you know a little bit about autism, they like their routine. And she's like, well, what are you talking about? I said, because I'm there one day, and we got another one the next week, and, and he doesn't have any routine. And she's like, well, who do you think you are? I said, I think I'm the guy driving your route that's done driving your route. <laughs> you know, I was not happy with it. The, pro the thing is, is when life throws you a curveball, what do you do with it? See, the spirit of power comes along and says, you know what? 2 Corinthians 4, you're still there? Look over at verse 17. For our light affliction is, which is but for a moment. Isn't that an interesting way to look at the curveball thrown in life? But you know where that comes out of? It comes out of the end of verse 16. Verse 16, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the what? The inward man is renewed, where? Day by day. Why do you think I send you those emails about reading? Just because I got nothing to do in the morning? Maybe. <laughs> who said that? <laughs> Get that one. Uh, I know who said it. He's sitting back there in the king's chair. Okay, but see, the thing is, is what do you need? What do you need? You need a day-by-day -day reading. You need a day-by-day -day renewing, because what does the renewing do for you? It tells you for the moment, the light affliction is just for a moment. And the proper way to look at it isn't to be in the issue of fear and intimidation, but to come along with some boldness and some courage and say, you know what, this thing can work for me a far more exceeding way to glory out there. You follow? You see how? Now, folks, we've been talking about this for 20 years. You see, the power is boldness, but it comes from the renewed mind. 
Then he says, I give you, not only did God give you power and the ability to have some courage and to have some, some, uh, some power to get through and the word begins to work in you, but he also gave you the spirit of love. That's the next chapter, 2 Corinthians 5, look at verse 14. Because if you're going to have the power and the boldness and the courage to do what needs to be done, it has to be done out of the right motivation. Because if it's not, it just becomes the, the sufficiency becomes about you and not who you are in Christ. 5.14, what's he say? For the love of Christ constraineth us. Because, why does the love of Christ constrain you? Why does the love of Christ come along, wrap his arms around you, and move you, motivate you to, to, a, to a different position? Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all. Boy, what, how do we think, judge, judgment, discernment, how do we think about this? That all of humanity, for by one man sin entered into the world, and then death passed upon all men, Romans 5.12. What do we understand? We understand that all men are sinners, don't we? And what did Christ do? Romans 5, verse 8. He died for you. That he can do what? 5.15. That they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Why did he do all that? Just to save you from hell? Well, yeah. But he's got a bigger picture, bigger plan, and that's for you to go live life to him, unto him. That's for you to go in your life. Whatever you do, I get up tomorrow morning. Actually, this evening, I'll get a text about where I'm supposed to be tomorrow. I'll get up in the morning, and you know what? I'll go, and I'll get there. I'll get in my truck or get in the car or whatever I have to do, and I go do the work. Why? It's my job, but why? whoop de doo I can be at Walmart and have a job. Stock and shelves. They're hiring, by the way. You walk in, big old signs, we're hiring. You can't help but notice. Why do you have a job? Why do I work? What's the motivating factor to go get the job and to work? What does the Word of God tell me about having a job? And what my responsibility as a husband and as a father is? Folks, I can be go, you can go do anything. But what's the book say you're to be doing? See how we just boiled right down into everyday life? It's how you think about it. you got to have that job because Paul says, get a job. Paul says, provide for yourself. Don't be a burden on people. Don't be a burden on mom and dad. Don't be a burden on society. Stand up. Be responsible for yourself. Have some courage, have some integrity, have some character to stand. Moms and dads, raise your kids that way. Get it? Come on, stand. You young people, get a job, man. Best thing ever happened to you. Have somebody tell you, no, you can't do something, and you pitch a fit and they fire you. You learn real quick. It ain't like college where they got the cry rooms for you. I was reading about that this week. I do a lot of reading when I have to sit sometimes. It's not always good. <laughs> you know? But what? Have, because you think a certain way. Why do we do what we do? Why do you do what you do? I was reading a thing about the, the Red for Ed stuff, and I was sitting there reading some stuff, and and they're like, well, we're doing this for the students. I'm like, no, you're not. You're doing it for a 20% pay raise. Now, some might, some might not. I don't know. You don't know everybody's intent or heart. I know that when I walked into the director of transportation at Mesa Public School and demanded a pay raise, you know what he told me? There's the door. <laughs> and I took the door. I understand. No, but why do you do what you do? See, the world out there does it for that almighty greenback in the bottom line. But what do you, why do you do that? 
See, the love of Christ does what? It comes on and motivates you to go do. It motivates you to have the power. It motivates you to, to come along and not live in the spirit of fear and intimidation. And then he says, and a spirit of the sound of a sound mind. Now we say all that to get to here. <laughs> and we got 10 minutes. But the sound mind. We'll come back to 2 Timothy 1. Actually, you know what? You're there in 2 Corinthians 5, right? Look back up there. No. All right. Go over to... If You were there in chapter 4. We read that about renewing your mind. Look over to Ephesians 4 with me. When we talk about the sound mind, the sound mind is what gives you the ability to evaluate what's going on in life according to who you are in Christ, where your standing is in your maturity level, what your understanding is going on. When I asked that stuff about the job, I took that's very basic. Okay, it's very simple. How do you, how do, where are you standing with that job? You, you, you're in Ephesians 4. If you look there at verse 23, he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Well, if you come over to chapter 6, we're talking about the job. Let's renew our minds a little bit about our jobs. Verse 5, servants be obedient to them that are your masters according to the flesh. Servants be what? Ooh, obedience is a tough thing, isn't it, in the workplace? But what are you to be doing? Obedient to your masters according to the flesh, with fear and trembling and singleness of your heart, but as unto who? As unto Christ. By the way, fear and trembling, what can, your, what can that master do to you? Terminate your employment, can't they? You ever, you ever been around a loud mouth on the job and they seem to get away with everything, so you try it and you're terminated? Yeah, I've been there, guilty, you know. And then two weeks later, they say, hey, Rick, would you come back? You know, I'm like, no, <laughs> you terminated me, you know. But, but you're doing it as unto who? Christ, not with eye service as men pleasers, but as the servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart, with good, with good will, doing service as to the Lord and not to men. Boy, what? look at that. If you had a mindset of that job being that way, oh my goodness, you would have such a different attitude on the job. Because who, that's the renewed mind thinking. The renewed mind, chapter 5, go back up there, verse number 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives. Chapter 6, verse 1, children, obey your parents. Fathers, provoke not your children. Bring them up in the nurture. Look at all of that. We're not talking about the ivory tower stuff. We're talking about the daily, the day-to-day -day stuff. And that renewed mind, that sound mind, the way you think about things, and, the, and having that ability to evaluate what's going on around you to say, yes, this is right, no, that's not right, I need to be doing this and not that, isn't a, He says, man, just do it as who you are in Christ. So you know what you need to know? You need to know who you are in Christ, don't you? And you get into that. If you're in Ephesians, come over to Colossians. Chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3. You see, folks, that sound mind is where the soundness in life comes to a reality, where, it, where, it meet, where the doctrine meets reality is in your thinking, and it's in your mindset. Colossians chapter 3. He's just told you in verse 8, well, verse 5. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. To mortify is to subdue it, to put it in subjection, to bring it. You know the, the, the uh, armor of God, and they got that belt, that girdle? That belt is designed to come in and come around you and take all the details, all the flowing details of life, the robe, and to bind it all together. And it's a girdle of what? I just had it until you said knowledge. <laughs> That's okay. It's a, it's, 
ha, uh, stand there for having your loins girt about with truth. <laughs> when you said knowledge, it was like, eh, eh, with truth. What do you do? You take, the tr- you take God's truth of the word rightly divided, and what do you do? You wrap your life up in it, and you bring it all under subjection and control. You see, that's why this is not something where you can just say, ah, give me something new. It's the way you think about what you're doing now. Because godliness is profitable now, and it's profitable in the ages to come. Colossians 3, verse 5, mortify, subdue. Mortify, therefore, your members upon the earth, fornication, uncleanliness, and the list goes on. Verse 8, but now ye also put off all these, Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy. Then, so he gives you the physical sins in verse six, 5, 6 there. Then in 8, he comes in with the attitude sins. Knock those off too. Boy, well, what, what do you got left? Just who you are in Christ. Now watch verse 10. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. That verse in 2 Corinthians 4 where he talks about renewed day by day, renewed in what? Renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. You're going to take Romans chapter 12 and verse 1 and verse number 2. Look over there. And you're going to renew your mind. You're going to take your thinking processes and you're going to bring them under and put them in subjection to the truth of God's word rightly divided. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. Oh, man, what a statement. Eleven chapters of doctrine dumped on you. And I mean, boom, it's heavy. In chapter 12, here's the first time he's ever said anything about you doing any kind of service at all. Romans 12, verse 1. I therefore, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. How are you supposed to present your body? Your body's not your own. You've been bought with the price. He owns your body. That's this thing, the physical thing. What are you to do with that bad boy? You're to present it as a living sacrifice. But wait a minute. Romans 6 said, I'm dead. That old man's been crucified. He's a dead guy. But in Romans 8, what do we learn? You're dead to sin, but you're alive to God, aren't you? You take that old dead body... And you make it a living sacrifice, holy. Wow, what a word. Because that's who you are now in Christ. Acceptable unto God. Before you were his enemy, before you were unacceptable, now because of who you are in Christ and who he's made you in Christ, you're now acceptable unto God. Which is your reasonable service? I love that word reasonable. God looks at Israel says, come and let's reason. What most people don't understand about the God of the Bible, God, is He is a reasonable God. Everybody goes, oh, He's not very loving. Look at what He's doing. It isn't about being loving. It's about being reasonable. Reason. Think this through. What's your reasonable service? And, verse 2, be not conformed to this world. How about let's make that some part of your reasonable service, not being conformed to this world. Some of you look like the world so bad who couldn't tell you between the, when the rapture happens and the Trump blows, he's going to yank you twice to get you out of here. That's a joke because you're so stuck down into the earth, into the system. Be not, tra- be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. In what? The knowledge after the image of him that created him. So you're going to renew your mind and who you are in Christ. Continue to grow. Why? That. The intent. The purpose. That you may approve, that you may prove that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Will of God. Wow. Wow. There's a goal behind all this. Come over to Philippians chapter 1. You see, folks, there's a goal here. And the goal of the sound mind is to take the sound doctrine, 
take the sound speech, take the sound in the faith, take who you are in Christ, renew that. Continually work on that in your life. Transform you. You know the transformers, more than meets the eye, you know, all that stuff. And take you, and here you were, I think about the potter's table and the clay. And where the Lord looks at Israel through Jeremiah, and he says, you're, a, you're like the potter's clay, and we're going to make a vessel. But that vessel gets marred. What can he do? He can tear it down and reshape it out. You and I are similar in that point. That's why Paul will use that in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Our lives are that way. You get married, you have kids, you get a house, you have kids, you got a job, you you get grandkids, and then you die. You got life, that cycle, that circle. But what happens is, is in that circle, you live that to who you are in Christ. That you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. I, I, I look at that, and I'm reminded of Philippians 1 when I think about that verse. Philippians 1, verse 9 and verse 10. Because that sound mind, the way you think about things, and what you allow to come into your mindset. If all you're watching is Fox News, and I pick on Fox because they're no better than CNN, or all you're watching is CNN, or all you're reading is the internet, you're bombarded by stuff that's not real. What's real? This right here. Trump, President Trump, called it right. It's all fake. I know what he's talking about. I'm talking about something completely different. That's not real. You know what all that's designed to do? Designed to get you out of thinking like you should be thinking as who you are in Christ. Philippians 1, verse 9, and we'll finish right here. And this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in judgment, in all judgment, that you may approve things that are what? Romans 12, foundation gets you started, the good, acceptable, and perfect. Here, as a perfected saint, someone who's moved through the doctrine, who's grown and grown and grown, now what are they looking at? Things that are just simply excellent, one word. Because the stuff over here, they've learned to discard. You know what they learn? They learn that they've had, you've learned this. I've learned it, that you have power over sin. Romans 6 says you do. You have power over sins, the activity. You have power over the sin because you're crucified to it. It's dead. It's gone. It has. What? Know you not that you're not under? uh, uh, Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Not under it. Not under the law. I'm under grace. It's done. I have power. Man, so guess what I can do? I don't have to argue. Is this activity sinful or not? I already know yay or nay. Now what are my my judgments are all based in what? Things that are excellent. Is it good to come to church? Is it excellent to Bible study? But is it excellent to do your job? Is it excellent to be the spouse you're supposed to be in your in your yeah? But is it better to be on the job than in the Bible study sometimes? Yeah. Because it's Monday morning at 7 a.m. and you better be where? On the job. All that is thinking. So when Paul says, man, you know what God gave you? He gave you power. He gave you the love, the motivation, and he, but he gave you a sound mind. He gave you the ability to look around your life and to evaluate what's going on based upon the, the, the doctrine, the sound doctrine of His Word put in you and make decisions in life. Have some stability. 
Well, Rick, I don't have a lot in there. Well, then let's get some in it. It's called study. It's called being here. It's called renewing, renewing your mind. So the soundness, what do you allow to hit into you? That's important. Again, if all you've got is TV and Internet and stuff like that, you're in a world of hurt. But man, if, if you allow the Word of God to come in, get that one verse in there a day, one little reading a day, and you know what quickly happens? You forget about all that other. And you begin saying, you know what? How can I be? How can I choose between what's more excellent? How can I go be who I'm supposed to be in Christ? How can I be the best at whatever job I'm doing? How can I be that best? I'm going to be it not. I'm going to be it because of who I am in Christ. And your attitude changes. That spirit changes. So the sound mind kind of takes it all together and just brings it down in because it's what you're allowing to influence your thinking process. And I'll be honest with you, I would hope that you would allow the Word of God to be the influence and the Word rightly divided. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your Word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for everything we have in your Son. And as the song says, I'd rather have Jesus than anything else. And I'd love that to be our cry into glory. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. We're going to stand. We'll be dismissed with the song and then